I don't have slides. It's all up here, kind of. Um, welcome, y'all. My name is Kate. Thank you so much, Paul. Definitely full circle. I remember that 23 years ago, rushing, going into your office with a whole lot of passion and being like, I need you to help me. And um, so my name is Kate. My pronouns are she, her. And um, I want to thank uh, Creative Mornings for asking me to be here today. Um, and I also want to thank you for showing up today because I know it's a choice. You know, there's many different things that you could be doing on this Friday morning, and today you've decided to be in community. And I truly believe that that is one of the cornerstones of change, is building community. And so when Steph asked me to, or Steph, to um, speak today, um, and she asked me to speak around the word reverie, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't know what that word meant. I heard it, I actually had a hard time saying it, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. But anytime I stumble upon a word um, that I don't know what it means, I always go to the dictionary. For a very long time, I'd go to the dictionary online, but this year for my birthday, I bought myself an actual dictionary. I can smell the smell of it. You know, and I'm like, oh, there's a lot of words in there, y'all. <laughs> and um, like you guys said, when you introduced uh, the word reverie, and this, it's a noun, it's a noun, because I love to talk about words, because words matter. And the meaning of reverie, oh, and of course, my note card has flying off here. Do you, you have it yeah. there? Okay, now I'm, now I'm really nervous. <laughs> it's a daydream, right? Yes, a state of being pleasantly lost in one's thought, a daydream. And so I sat with that word for a little bit and I started to think about myself as a child. I, bought, I was born and raised on the south side of Chicago and I remember as a young child laying, I can smell the grass. Chicago has great grass. It's like soft, it's not like the grass here, that, that crab kind of grass. And I remember like laying on my back and staring at the sky and allowing myself space to daydream. And I was born into this world and this planet with a lot to say. I came out of my mom's womb like angry, I'm an Aries, and wanting to change the world. But what happened along the way is the world started to change me. Because I had this dream. The first thing is, I loved to write. I had journals, I had, di I had diaries. I loved to write, and I would write, write, write. And I remember in the third grade, I sat at a parent-teacher conference with my mom, and the teacher said, she's just not a great writer. She has a really hard time pronouncing words. She's not a great speller. And as that happened, there was a little bit of that dream space theft that happened and I kind of sunk into my chair a little bit. I remember, just like the grass, I remember that, where I was, what, what was on the bulletin board when that teacher said that to me, to my mom. And so, but they said, but she's, she's nice. My goodness. <laughs> So from there, I went on to do some movement as a child. You know, they put me in soccer. First time I was in soccer, I actually tried to score on the same goal of the team. And my teammate, I put my teeth into his forehead. And I'll never forget the coach saying to my mother, movement's just not really her thing. Okay, so I'm not a great writer. I'm not really great at moving, so there was a little bit of dream theft. And the last thing that happened was in seventh grade, I was in charge of the spelling bee, where I had to stand and say the words. Now, like I said, when I look at words, it's really hard for me to pronounce them phonetically. My husband knows this. <laughs> it's been a struggle. And the word, and I was in the seventh grade classroom, was fatigue. You could imagine the terror when I looked at that word. 
And I got up there and I was like, spell Fatigue. <laughs> and everyone burst out in laughter. And I didn't know why they were laughing. And then my seventh grade teacher said, hey, maybe speaking in public is not really her thing. There was a little bit of dream theft there. So what you are witnessing right now is my reverie. I have fought so hard to be standing here with a microphone. Each week I write, and it's only in the last five years I've come to acknowledge that I am a good writer. For the last 16 years, I have taught movement in some capacity. I have taught spin, I've taught fitness, um, I've taught yoga, I've, I've not taught Zumba, I'm not there. <laughs> I do not have the coordination for that, maybe they were right on that. And every Sunday, for nine years at the Poor House, I put on a headset like Janet Jackson and I speak in front of the pu public, people. So when I was thinking about reverie, I started to walk around, like at the grocery store, I do this a lot, or I'm driving my car, or wherever I'm at, and I'm like, what daydream is inside of you? And you, and you, and you, and you, that maybe someone else's words took from you. Because I couldn't talk about reverie without talking about that. And the other thing I couldn't do with talking about reverie is talking about the systems that we live in that steal our daydreams. How some people are able to dream and live out those dreams and some people are not. Because of the systems we live in. And so when I decided to do this work and I got here, like Paul said, I decided to tackle the systems first because that seemed easier than tackling my own personal journey. I know, crazy, right? And so my, from 23 years ago, I think that started about 20 years ago, I had this daydream of what the world could be. And I was going to do everything in my power to make that happen. So like Paul said, I showed up at the college and I was the president of Alliance for Planet Earth. Yes, I started the recycling program at the College of Charleston. And at that point, that was a daydream. President Sanders was the president there. I held a sit-in in his office. I was extremely annoying to this man. And he said to me, Proof, why is this important? And I had to get real creative. I said, I'm not leaving. This was at his home. <laughs> yeah, this was, we were at his office, but his home was right on George Street. Like, and he came in his robe and I was like, hi, we're here. And we're not leaving until we get this. Creative. And then from there, yes, I worked with Nike Wages to expose what is still happening today. Sweatshops for like, sweatshop labor, systems that we live in. And then from there, I graduated in the College of Charleston and started to work for a nonprofit. I started to write grants. I wrote grants, that's wild to me. I'd love to talk to my third grade teacher about that. And then from there, I decided a cubicle wasn't really for me because I felt just really stifled. So then from there, I got my degree at the College of Charleston in education. I decided to go teach public school. I taught at Goodwin Elementary, um, second and fourth grade. And I worked with these children. And my goal when I was there was to see and believe and hear their daydream. But I could see how my access to my dream daydream was a lot different from their access to theirs, right? They have a lot more obstacles because of the systems that they were born into. So I kept working, and eventually, I burnt out. Anyone else ever experienced that before? <laughs> 
my daydream, my collective daydream, burnt me out. And so from that burnout, I found myself on, um, oddly enough, and Gold's Gym in, West, uh, in James Island on, yeah, whoop! <laughs> I, I worked there for 10 years, but before I worked there, I found myself in their yoga room. If you've been in your yoga room, it's, their yoga room, it's, no offense, but it's, it was the perfect place for me to be. It was dingy, it was dark, and it was kind of dirty. And this teacher told me to breathe. And I feel like it was the first time that I actually, when I got on that yoga mat, began to like think about what happened to my daydream. And through that, through that journey of moving on the yoga mat and coming to get to know myself through rest, I was able to begin to like pick up that pen again and write. I was being able to, like, this is when I started to be like, hey, maybe I could teach movement. Hey, maybe I could speak in front of people. And I had people around me that I remember my, the person that was, at, that was the owner, the group fitness instructor, I tried to quit four times. I go to her and I'm like, I'm just, this is not for me. Because seriously, y'all, I would get up in there and I'd be like, <laughs> Do the, you know, move the bar, do this. And I was shaking and I was terrible at it. Chad can attest. Uh, he wasn't in the room, but he knew. I like practice, practice, practice. And I was like, this does not come easy to me, but I know it is inside of me. And so I went on and I taught there for 10 years. But in that time, I started to realize that I was in this wellness world that was so disconnected from the social change world that I has been work, work that I had been working in, so I changed. I exchanged one world for another, and then I started to ask, just like how some people can have access to dream and some don't. How come some people have access to wellness and some people don't? And it all came back to one thing: the systems that we live in was creating this dream theft either from the words that people say to you or the systems that you are born into. So from there, my daydream, and I had to get really creative. I wanted to marry these two worlds. And I didn't know how. Nine years ago, Vanessa Harris from the Poor House approached me. And she said, I really like the music you play in Spin. <laughs> If you know anything about music, the Poor House is a grassroots, family-run business that brings music to the masses, to the community. And she said, hey, would you like to teach yoga on the deck? I'll tell you, I told her no right away. Because I was terrified. But I sat with it for a while. She'll tell you she never gave up on me. Says, why? For your reverie, surround yourself with people that see something in you even before you do. And so, I finally said yes. And nine years ago, I started to teach a class at the Boar House where I married the wellness world with social change. I didn't know what it was gonna look like. It took a few years. The first class had four people. I was terrified, <laughs> and, but I had a vision that was so anchored in my reverie, in that daydream of what is possible. And I remember writing down my why. And y'all, the why was not connected to what the systems tell us. It wasn't like, I want to make as much money as possible. That wasn't it. My why was, I want to bring people to com into community through music, through art, because if you've been on the Poor House deck, like uh, Nicholas says, my daughter has murals up there. They're, they're constantly just pushing the bill of public art there. So music, art, words. I wanted to write every single week, and I do. And I stand up there, and I let the words just come out of me. I wanted movement. Something I was told I was not going to ever do. And yes, you can call it yoga, but 
but I am like, not really. It is yoga. We're doing the asana, but it's so much more. It is a movement. And I wanted action. I wanted to bring people from the community to stand up and bring calls to action to ask people to show up, to change the systems that were keeping our daydreams from being a reality. It started with four people. Every Sunday, there's over a hundred. Nine years. Eventually this year we had to get a doorman, which was like super nervous to me, so I asked this man to be my doorman. And my children, they come too. Because I, my, it kind of was like, uh, I've never, my why was never to turn anyone away. So people that know me, I try to fit as many people on that deck as possible because me turning someone away just crushes my soul because it was not connected to my why. My why was I wanted to, people to be able to show up in this place as they are and be who they are and be able to have the space to cultivate their reverie. Reverie. See, it's hard for me to say. Their daydream. In this class, y'all, every Sunday, we talk about what matters to us personally. Like, really anchor in, like, what matters to you? We talk about what matters to you collectively every Sunday. We get really clear on that. And then there's a portion of this class and some people might say that this class is the most challenging class in the city. You're like, really? Because of one part of it. Every Sunday, I crank a song. And I put down my mic, and I say, you do you. You're already feeling a little awkward, aren't you? Right, and this comes from one of my teachers, Eric Schiffman. And I'll never forget, I took his class, and now he's sitting on a rock in Santa Monica somewhere. He doesn't teach anymore, but I went to his class, and he did a freedom-style yoga class. And within 45 minutes, he cranked Lenny Kravitz, and he's like, now you move. And I was like, I paid you to tell me where to put my foot, and how to breathe, and how to feel, and how to heal. I paid you to do that for me. And he was like, no, that reverie lives inside of you. And then here's all these people like, am I doing it right? Oh my gosh. And so from that first class nine years ago, there has not been a Sunday where we have not done that. And one time there was a man that came and he was watching this portion of the class and he came up to me after class and he goes that's the most disorganized class i have ever seen in my life i said yeah that's what you call freedom and so from that freedom of like challenging the systems we live in asking why some people have access to their dreams and some people don't. Like really asking those questions and like bringing some resistance towards the systems in tune helps us personally show up for each other. It's uncomfortable. There's so many times that I've taught this class where I've had to talk about really uncomfortable situations in this country. But I never shy away from them because I know that is what will unlock the reverie inside of each one of us to imagine the world that we can all live in. So, I hate feeling like I'm the only person in the room, so I brought props. If you have a post-it note, and I have more here, Nine years ago, before I taught the Poor House class, I started to write down my, what matters to me personally. And I'm gonna tell you guys, at the end of the day, they're not gonna talk about your biceps. They're not gonna talk about your ass. They're not, like, and, and a lot of time in the wellness world, that's what they were talking about. Like, get smaller, get quieter, get better biceps. But at the end of the day, that's not what they're gonna talk about, right? They're gonna talk about 
how you made other people feel. They're going to talk about your reverie. They're going to talk about your dream and how you were courageous enough to follow it. Collectively, what are they going to say about us? I look at my three children and I see them being to, beginning to cultivate their daydreams. And my dream that I have for them, for a world where they can live in, where they're safe to go to school. Because every day when I say goodbye to my son, I'm the car rider drop off for my son Rowan. I love you now means so much. It's different. And some days he walks on, I go, hey, hey, I need to tell you one more time. I love you, you know that, right? And that's when I get into that collective reverie. I know what is inside of us. And I wanted to create a space that could cultivate that, that could have those discussions. I never skirt around what's happening on the, in the world because what's happening in the world is happening inside of us. And I'll take it full circle. I walked around the grocery store the other night and every person I stopped by, went by, not in a creepy way, I promise, but I was like, there's a solution inside of you. And then you, and you, and you, and you, and you. But maybe what happened along the way, maybe the systems we're living in, maybe a third grade teacher, I told you, you couldn't write. But I know they're inside of us. We just need to cultivate the spaces where we can have the conversations. So, start here on a post-it note. If you want, I want you to draw a line down the middle. And on one side, I want you to maybe, maybe you have a personal reverie. Something that when you were a child, that you dreamed of becoming or doing. And on the other side, and if you need more, I've got more, a collective reverie. What do you dream about for the collective? Like, what do you want to see? And I know that is a very nuanced question. But I'll be honest with you, when I started the Poor House class, I was real simple and clear. And I always go back to that because there's so many times in my life where I'll have asks and I can, should I do this, should I do that? And I go back to that why, that original why, why I created this class. And it never, it, it's simple. So a personal reverie, and let it be as wild as possible. Because for me, it is wild that I'm standing up here in front of you with a microphone. Wild. And a collective reverie. Let it be wild, because we need wild. We need imagination. What we're doing right now is not working. So we need to get creative. And I put it double-sided, because I want you to put it on your mirror. <laughs> or your, your dashboard. And maybe on the back, put your why. Why? Why do you want to do that? What is your reason? And you can, only, you can do it now, you can do it when you get home. But I'm going to close my, my, my talk, my talk, <laughs> with how I close the poor house class every Sunday. And I want you to take that piece of paper, even if you have not written on it yet, that's okay because a blank page that's possibility and if you don't have it it's okay I want you to put your hands like this into prayer and you don't have to call it prayer today we'll call I, I was born with a voice like I said I, I came out loud <laughs> they tried to quiet me you see how that worked out and I want you to hold your hands at reverie usually I say at the courthouse hold your hands at prayer and eyes open or eyes closed Collectively, take a big inhale in, please. Exhale, sigh it out. I want you to hold your hands at 
reverie like the reverie was already answered. Whatever that daydream may be, what does it helps me get up here every day. Like, I listen to the words and the lyrics. Marvin Gaye, What's Going On? I mean, y'all, that was the best album ever put out in history. And he took his music ability, his creativity, and used it towards social change. And sang about it. And I brought all my books, my books. And I brought my family with me. Because they are my people. Like, surround yourself with the people that believe, see, and hear you. Thanks for having me, y'all. Wow. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, I don't know about y'all, but I really need to hear that tonight. Um, and get inspired. Like, that's one of the main reasons why I started coming to Creative Mornings, sort of volunteering for Creative Mornings, is to get inspired and within a community. So thank y'all so much for showing up today and choosing to come and wake up early. I know it's hard, it's hard for me. Um, and I'm a volunteer. I'm like, why do I volunteer for a morning? <laughs> um, but we're gonna do a quick Q&A with Kate. Um, so yeah, let's fire it away. Who has a question for Kate? Don't be shy. Don't make me go. I see you brought some books. Can you speak maybe a little bit about some books that have been, that have had an impact on like your life and you might recommend sharing? Yeah, for sure. Some women buy shoes, I buy books. I know, my husband's like, is there another book? <laughs> another book. Um, yeah, I have a, a bunch of different books by a lot of different thought leaders. Um, one that I'm um, currently reading, and I don't know if Sarah Nelson is here, but yesterday we and her were talking about this. Is anyone uh, familiar with the NAP ministry? Yeah. <laughs> and um, that's Trisha Hersey, and she wrote a book called Rest is Resistance. And I actually was going to plan, I had it in my note cards. I didn't do anything that was on my note cards. It's so funny how I do that. But I was going to read a, a passage from this book. But this book is revolutionary because... It's the same thing I'm saying of like, who has access to rest and who does not? And like asking that question, because it's in rest where we're able to access that daydream. Like I said about the little kid laying in the grass. As little kids, but then the world gets a hold of us, right? And tells us what's successful. And we live in a grind culture, right? Where it's like more, 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 keep going, quit going. And we're tired, we're exhausted, we're burnt out, we're overwhelmed. So it's like really hard 
to access that reverie. So this book has been like really profound. Um, I have, I mean, there's so many. Me and White Supremacy by um, Layla uh, Sad has been a huge, huge um, book for me. I've learned so much. Emergent Strategies by um, Adrienne Marie Brown. She's an amazing thought leader that uses reverie to like imagine the world that is possible for all of us. Um, uh, I have this awesome Clint Smith, Above Ground. He's an amazing poet. I love poetry. I love memoirs, um, fiction, nonfiction. Um, and like I said, music is such a cornerstone. Um, I listen to lyrics. I love to like pull the lyrics up. Like next time you hear a song, go and Google the lyrics and just read them. Because it's so profound. You're just like, how? Is this possible that someone so creative can take lyrics and make it to music and like create change like this? It, it blows my mind. So you're welcome to come check out. I could have sit here and talk about books all day on. Anyone else? Hey, Kate. Hi. Thanks for being here this morning. Um, it's easy, like listening to you talk about you reclaiming your movement, your speech, your writing, to be like, wow, she's done the work. She's you know done. So I was wondering what's on your post-it notes. Oh. Are we ever done? Uh, what is on my post-it note? <laughs> oh, what's on Sunday? We're gonna talk about reverie on Sunday. I'm gonna go there. Um, you know what, right now, I don't think I'm done. I don't think we're ever like have it all figured out. I tell people all the time, and, and if someone comes to me and is like, I have it all figured out, I'll, I always say to them, I'll, I'll talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> but you know, like, I, I am in a bit of a transition right now. I don't know what's next. I know that the poorhouse is, um, is, is the place on Sunday morning where I feel the most where I can be myself, and, 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 and where I'm creating the most change in community. Um, to, but to be honest, I've been asked a lot in the last few months to do things like this. And um, I think I want to be more of a, a, a speaker. Uh, um, and and I, I eventually, I mean, I have a book in my back pocket. I have a book. Like, I want to I send it to my third grade teacher. And I want to send a video of me speaking to my seventh grade teacher. You know, and be like, your words matter. Your words matter, and, 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 and I've had to fight really hard to be here, so that's a good question. I'm in, I'm in the transition. I'm in the liminal space of that. Yeah. One more question? Yeah. I found it really interesting that you uh, started with, like, outward change, trying to change everything, and uh, I'm kind of in a reverse situation. I grew up in a very, like, small system, and I've left that system and I've been working towards making changes in myself and now I find myself drawn to the change of community. How do you, but I find, like I'm not, I don't have the, the voice or I don't feel comfortable with the voice of like really speaking out against injustices and things like that yet. So how did, do you, how did you get to that point? Um, how did I get to the point of being feeling comfortable with speaking out against injustice? I've messed up a lot of times. Some of my friends say I'm, uh, that I work with and I organize that I'm like a leech. <laughs> I just keep coming back. And I think the biggest thing that has helped me is my ability to listen. To listen to the people that are the most marginalized on the front line and know that like it's not really like yes i have the mic and i think i was born like into a system that like allows me to have the mic you know um i'm a white woman hetero um cisgendered woman you know i i at my, my proximity to power and privilege is closer and so i've gotten it wrong a lot of times i do <laughs> Definitely. And I think that what has helped me speak more out is my ability, like I said, to listen to those that are on the front line that are most infected by injustice and me showing up and saying, instead of saying like, 
I know what you need, instead saying, how can I support? You know, and sometimes that means because of my proximity to power and privilege that I am more in a place of safety to be able to speak out because there's less risk. And so when I think about it that way, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna speak, I'm gonna speak, you know? And I'm not speaking for those that can't speak. That's not something, because everyone can speak, you know? I think for a long time you're like, I speak for the voiceless. No one is voiceless. No one is voiceless. But some people, there's more risk. And so when I put it that way, I'm like, how dare I not use that privilege? You know, and it's kind of taken a little bit away the fear, and I mess up. I think sometimes, like, it's really hard because we do live in a culture that people are constantly microscoping, like, oh, you said this wrong, or you did this wrong, you did this wrong. You know, we hear about cancel culture a lot, and sometimes with a lot of people that I organize with, I'm like, well, are we recreating the systems, recreating the systems that we're trying to fight? You know? And a lot of times that is, so people are more afraid to speak out. So I think just listening and asking like, what do you need? And sometimes it's like, I need you to speak up. I'm like, okay, I can do that. But that's a great question. And I get it wrong all the time. <laughs> but that doesn't keep me from showing up. Anything else? Ah, Stacy. I was born with a big voice too. That's why we're uh, friends. <laughs> my question is for the room. Um, I've been going to yoga at the poor house with my children for like five or six years since my babies were babies. Um, I would be curious for everyone to raise their hand if they have attended a yoga at the Four House. This is the care that Kate puts into the community that people want to show up to support her on a Friday morning. So thank you, Kate. Thank you, Stacey. And that's one last like plug. I, I want the kids to be there. The kids are there on Sunday morning. They come and sometimes they cry and I'm like, Please cry, because I want to cry, too. <laughs> and, like, I see a kid doing a tantrum. I'm like, oh, I want to do that sometimes. Don't you? And you're like, no, 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 don't cry. Keep your kid together. And I'm like, no. You know, like, eventually society grabs them, and they're like, don't feel. You know? So they're also always welcome. Thank you so much, Stacy. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, I will say too, uh, before we get to thanking our sponsors, um, 